All right. So today we're finishing up finally our World War One PowerPoint. We've we've gotten through kind of the overview of how it started, a uh, little bit about what the war was like, some of the ramifications. Uh, we also closed out yesterday talking about two things that, that kind of went along with the war that, that caused uh, additional loss of life. We talked about the Armenian genocide, and then we closed out with the uh, the Spanish flu, which you know really kind of spread due to all these soldiers, you know, traveling all around the world. Uh, many more died than World War I itself, maybe 50 million, some say as high as 100 million. Uh, again, you know, given the, the pandemic we're currently in, it's kind of interesting to just see something similar, although much more severe, uh, that had happened in the past. So today we're going to talk about the peace agreement. We'll talk about some of the ramifications of that. I've got probably three short videos we're going to watch, and they're, they're like three, four minutes each, maybe. Uh, and we've got just a few slides left. Uh, I can't guarantee we're going to finish early. And if we do finish early, I don't know how much time we'll have. But if we do have a little extra time, check your grades. If there's still stuff you owe, man, today's the day. Uh, 4.30, all uh, assignments in Canvas are going to shut down. Retakes are going to shut down. The extra credit's going to shut down. So if there's still some stuff that you owe, uh, if we have time in class, maybe you could work on it. Maybe you could do that at lunch. Uh, but this is really your last opportunity to raise your grade for the six weeks. Uh, tomorrow should be a pretty straightforward day. We'll come in, we'll review a little bit, probably watch the crash course over World War I, because again, it's good review. Uh, and then we'll do our SAQ. Should be a pretty straightforward, easy day. Uh, your SAQ is going to be your first daily grade of this upcoming next six weeks. Uh, the only other thing is, you know, it's been a while since we did a seating change. Uh, so I'm thinking Monday, Tuesday, at some point next week, we're probably going to mix it up a little bit. Um, again, I like to do that every so often. Uh, but if you've got some preferences, if there's an area of the room you would like to sit in, if there's somebody you would like to sit by, I could even do that. Maybe depending on you know how many requests we have, let me know. Uh, again, I'd like you guys to have a little bit of ownership of where you're going to sit. I'm not going to just let you come in here and and choose, I guess you could say, but but I do want you to have some some sort of consultation. So over the next couple of days, let me know if you have a preference, if there's an area of the room or someone you want to sit by, uh, a situation that's going to make you a little bit more comfortable, maybe help you do a little bit better. Uh, let me know and we can we can try to make that happen at some point next week. All right, so where we left off, the Spanish flu, aka the influenza pandemic of 1918. Uh, again, maybe killed 50 million, maybe killed 100 million. No one really knows exactly where it started. Uh, we are pretty certain, though, it didn't actually start in Spain. Kind of unfortunate that, that nickname has continued over the years. Uh, but they were the first ones to really report on the uh, pandemic openly and, you know, the nickname over the years stuck. So fighting ends in 1918, you know, Armistice Day, Veterans Day, uh, November 11th, I believe. We, we still celebrate it to this day. But in order for there to be an official peace, you know, the, the leaders of, of the various countries involved needed to come together and, and hammer out some terms, an actual peace treaty. And that all took place at the Paris Peace Conference, which is fitting because a lot of the war was fought in France. Four world leaders that ended up on the, the uh, winning side, the allies, kind of led the, the peace conference. They were definitely the ones that had the most say in what was going to happen. Uh, they called them the Big Four. I'll show you a picture here in a second. First, you got U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. Now, granted, we only actually fight in the last year, but we probably provided some some support before that. Uh, and, you know, we did come in and, and really push the allies over the top. So Wilson had a seat at the table. Uh, he was going to get some of the things he wanted, but because of our relatively limited contribution, he certainly wasn't going to get everything. But, you know, the U.S. is starting to become a main player. Uh, so, yeah, he's he's one of the leaders, one of the organizers of this peace conference. Next, you have David Lloyd George, prime minister of Great Britain. You have George Clemenceau. Uh, he's the leader of France. And you have Vittorio Orlando of Italy. Now, Italy's kind of interesting. 
Before World War I, you may recall, they were a member of the Triple Alliance. They were buddies with Germany and Austria-Hungary. But once the war actually broke out, they didn't, they didn't side with them. They were actually neutral for a while. And then before the end of the war, they did switch sides entirely, and they went over to the Allies. Their hope, you know, if they were on the winning side, they kind of saw the writing on the wall. Maybe they would get something out of it, maybe some territorial gains. Again, what you're going to see here is what we call a victor's peace. The winners of the war are going to dictate what's going to happen, what the punishments are going to be, what the ramifications are going to be. Um, that, that unfortunately is common in warfare. The winning side, you know, they get to set the terms. And the losing side doesn't really have a whole lot of choice in the matter. So Wilson comes with an agenda. He's stressing peace without victory. Uh, and he pushed for a peace plan outlined in his 14 points. Uh, definitely have down the 14 points. It's, it's one of the things that Woodrow Wilson uh, was really defined by. He, he thought this is going to be his legacy. He went in with, with basically a 14 point plan. Hey, here's the things that we need to do to have a lasting peace, to prevent another massive global catastrophe like this. Now, again, the U.S. only fights in the last year of the war. So on one hand, you know, the British and the French, they're not going to give Wilson everything he wants, but they do got to give him a little bit because he did help. And, and, you know, he's one of the ones running this thing. So he gets some of what he wants. He doesn't get everything. One of the main things he was pushing for was the creation of a League of Nations, an organization in which all nations of the world would convene to discuss conflicts openly, a way to prevent simmering tensions that could lead to another world war. Now, we talked about this the other day, but do we have something like that today? It's a trick question. We do. Anybody remember what it was called? the United Nations, okay? The United Nations gets set up after World War II. The League of Nations was set up after World War I. Obviously, the League of Nations didn't really do its job because, again, we had a World War II. So, no one's really crazy about the League of Nations, but, you know, through some negotiation, the, the other leaders of major world nations say, you know what, yeah, maybe that's not that bad about it. I mean, Wilson had been badgering him about it. He's got these 14 things he wants. They've got to give him something. Uh, they give him a little bit more than this, but but they got to give him something. So they say, fine, Woody, we will join this League of Nations. We'll do it. Fine. That sounds great. Wilson goes home. He doesn't get everything that he wants at the end of this, but he goes home. He's happy. He's all pumped. He's about to run for reelection. He goes to Congress and he says, all right, guys, we got it. We got the League of Nations. And Congress says, well, that sounds cool, but we're not going to join. Although the other nations agreed to establish the league, the U.S. Senate voted against joining, stressing an official policy of isolationism instead. So he pushes for this, this organization. He says this is what's going to create a lasting peace, a, a sort of organization where we can get together and we can debate, we can negotiate. And, and a lot of other nations did say, OK, that doesn't sound too bad. We'll join. Imagine if I started a club, if I'd been talking for weeks, hey, guys, we're going to have the history club. And you guys are all looking at me kind of like you are now. Well, that sounds lame. But no, I say it every single day. I hammer it into your heads. And, you know, finally, after a few weeks, you're like, fine, we'll go to your stupid history club. So the day comes, it's after school. It's, you know, you're having to stay late. It's like 430. You roll up and I'm already going. I decide, you know what? History club sucks. History club's probably not going to last very long, right? If you start a club and then refuse to join your own club, the club really has no validity. So while you did still kind of sort of have a League of Nations, because, you know, the, the, the groundwork was already laid, it never really had much legitimacy. There was never any, any power. The League couldn't really make any decisions and enforce them. It didn't have any sort of uh, military capability. It was just a place where people could go and complain. And because the United States didn't join the club that they insisted on starting, it was seen as illegitimate from the start. Kind of a messed up deal. 
So Woodrow Wilson, and he doesn't get reelected president either. He actually gets sick and he dies soon after this. But, uh, you know, he, he, man, he, he didn't have the pulse of, of what was going on in the United States. Most people in the U.S. never wanted to go to World War I. It was a foreign war. It was a European war. It was their problem. We got drug into it, you know, due to our economic and political ties with Great Britain and France, due to the unrestricted submarine warfare, the sinking of the Lusitania, excuse me, uh, due to the Zimmerman telegram. There's some things that pushed us into war. But but once the war was over, it's like, all right, let's go back over here and worry about us. We enter an official phase of isolationism. It's not that we're not going to trade with people. We'll trade with people. We'll sell them stuff. You know, we'll make money off of them. But politically, we don't want to be involved in a bunch of alliances. We don't want to really have to do much with other nations at all. Because you got to think geographically, the U.S., I mean, we got Canada, the north, we got Mexico to the south, you know, countries historically we've had OK relationships with. We don't really at this point in time have to worry about them invading us. And on the other sides, we've got oceans. Those are their problems over there. Let us do us. So for the next several years, we're trying to stay out of all this stuff. And that's essentially what we did. Wilson also had some other things he wanted that he kind of sort of gets. Uh, part of his 14 points, you know, he's talking about the fact that, you know, nationalism its one of these things that really led to war. Wilson believed that conquered peoples of Europe, that's going to be important, under the defeated central powers deserve the right to self-determination. You know, the, the Ottoman Empire, kind of, uh, but really Austria-Hungary and the German Empire, those are pretty big territories. And they, they both had different ethnicities, different cultural groups within their territories that, that were nationalists, that wanted countries of their own. They were on the losing side. They should lose their empire. Wilson actually gets this because it's something everybody could kind of agree on. Several new nations were created or resurrected in Europe. You know, older nations that had kind of gotten, uh, you know, thrown by the wayside and absorbed into larger empires. You know, you see some make a comeback. Uh, this is when you get, you know, more or less the modern Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia, which has since been broken apart. Most of these countries were homes to Slavic people. Most of them were in Central in Eastern Europe. But wait a minute. Aren't there other people that have been conquered and colonized out there that might want self-determination too? That's an actual question. Are there? Have the Europeans conquered and colonized anywhere else? Like where? What about Africa? What about Asia? What about like the whole stinking world? Wilson's only talking about people in Europe, white Europeans. This is going to be important moving forward. So here's the big four. You got old uh, Woodrow Wilson, the tallest guy here to the right. Um, over on the other side, I think that's David Lloyd George on the far left talking to, uh, to uh, David Lo or wait. Yeah, talking to, I think the guy from France, and then I think the Italian guy, uh, Vittorio uh, Orlando's apparently the only one that knew that they were posing for a picture. Um, we're going to watch our first two videos because they go over this. They go over the Treaty of Versailles, and ultimately it's going to be kind of hammered out out of this peace conference. And then we'll kind of get into the notes and, and see how this treaty really wasn't a very good uh, it probably created more problems in the long run. Than it's like. So each of these videos, I don't even know why I separated them because they're really, really short, but it's, they're like simple history videos, but they do a good job kind of breaking down what the peace conference is like and some of the things that the treaty ends up saying. The Treaty of Versailles, 1919. World War One officially came to an end with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles on June 28, 1919. 32 countries had come together in Paris in January 1919 to hold a conference which would make peace after the First World War. It would be dominated by the Big Three, David Lloyd George representing Britain, George Clemenceau representing France, and Woodrow Wilson 
representing the USA. Germany was not invited. The big three wanted different things for Germany and disagreed on how harshly they were to be punished, reflecting how their countries were treated in the war. They had to negotiate with each other until there was a compromise. This was difficult because Wilson was opposed to harsh punishment for Germany. The USA had not been involved in the war as long as Britain and France and had not received as much damage. He wanted to prevent another world war by creating the League of Nations based on his 14 points to ensure Germany would not be destroyed and that Germany shouldn't be blamed for the war. Clemenceau's aims were the harshest of the three representing the damage Germany had done to France's land and people and its threatening proximity. He wanted revenge and to punish Germany to return Alsace-Lorraine to France, an independent Rhineland, no League of Nations, Germany to pay huge reparations for the damage and losses caused, the disbandment of the German army so that Germany would never be strong enough to attack France again. Lloyd George was an in-between. This reflected Britain, which had little land damage but high war losses. He wanted a punishment that would be tough enough to please those who wanted to make Germany pay but would leave Germany strong enough to still trade. Land for Britain's empire. To safeguard Britain's naval supremacy. When the Treaty of Versailles was ready, Germany was shown the document, but there was no negotiation. Their rebuttal ignored. On 28 June 1919, the delegates met at the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles near Paris and forced two German representatives to sign it. All right. Part two to learn what the terms two. of the treaty of. And again, I don't know why they decided to make it into two parts, but whatever. Let's look at what this uh, this treaty actually said. Uh, like I said, the French they were hardcore. They they had the most damage. A lot of fighting took place in France, so they wanted to punish the country that they saw as the most responsible, the country for the central powers that did most of the fighting, Germany, which just happened to be their next door neighbor. Uh, Great Britain, a little bit more in between, but, but they also wanted to punish Germany. Uh, obviously, the United States, Woodrow Wilson, he was the most laid back. Hey, let's just all try to have a, a cool agreement to be peaceful and, and not really uh, cast the majority of blame on anyone. Let's see what the actual agreement said. Again, Germany was pretty much forced to sign this. They didn't have a whole lot of choice. The Treaty of Versailles, 1919. The terms of the Treaty of Versailles were divided into three groups, territorial, military, and financial and economic. Here are some of the territorial terms. Alsace-Lorraine was returned to France. Germany was forbidden to unite with Austria. Lands in East Germany, including the farmlands of Posen and the Polish corridor between East Germany and East Prussia, were given to Poland. The Saar, which had rich coal fields, were given to France for 15 years. All Germany's colonies were taken and given to France and Britain as mandates. Here are some of the military terms. The German army was restricted to only 100,000 men. The Navy could now only have six battleships and no submarines, and there was to be no air force allowed. The Rhineland was demilitarized. This meant the German army could not go to this area between France and Germany. For the financial and economic terms, Germany would have to pay reparations, which would eventually be set at an enormous 132 billion gold marks. On top of this, Germany was not allowed to join the League of Nations and had to accept responsibility for causing all the damage and loss by the war. Overall, the Treaty of Versailles was unpopular with Germany and its creators. Its terms would go on to be reversed by Germany in both secret and in the open by Hitler and help cause World War II. Watch our other videos to learn more. Get your copy of... Okay, let's talk about this real quick in a little bit more detail. You do need to know some of these terms of the treaty because again, these terms are or what allow Adolf Hitler to, to ultimately get elected to power. Yeah, Hitler was originally elected and then just kind of seized ultimate power. Um, but but also, you know, obviously leading to World War II uh, sometime later. Good little political cartoon here, um, you know, and, and it kind of explains why the League of Nations didn't work. The whole idea 
was for the League of Nations to prevent another world war from happening. And you get Wilson, he gets people to buy in these other, you know, um, predominant countries. And, and but but you had to have the U.S. They were the leaders of this. They were they were the ones who originated this initiative. And without them, I mean, this thing was was ultimately doomed to fail. Again, it's pretty crazy that that we, our president, comes up with this idea. Then our country says, no, he ain't joining. Another uh, uh, little political cartoon. Uh, you've got, you know, the leaders of uh, some of these other nations like France and Britain, and and these are the peace terms, and they're just going to shove it down Germany's throat because, again, this is a a victor's peace. Uh, it it wasn't necessarily fair, at least a lot of people saw. Uh, but Germany, towards the end of the war, was ready for it to be done. Uh, a new government actually took over Germany, you know, in the interim, you know, while they were uh, negotiating the peace, the old uh, government had pretty much done away with. Uh, and it's this brand new government that kind of accepts these terms. It's understandable that the German people would stop trusting their government after a while, especially this new government. Uh, they were called the Weimar Republic. One of the biggest things that's just obvious is territorial changes. I mean, look, look at these maps. This is the war, you know, war, you know, Europe. Uh, you got people that are neutral. You got people that, that are on the allies, you know, the triple entente. You got the central powers, right? Um, you got some pretty large, what we could say, empires. You got the German Empire. You got Austria-Hungary. Uh, you can only really see Turkey here, but it's part of the larger Ottoman Empire. This is what happens afterwards. Germany loses a lot of territory. The older nation of Poland gets a lot of that, you know, a, a new modern nation, I guess you could see. Uh, you get all these territories up in Eastern Europe. Uh, Austria-Hungary ceases to exist. You get Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, bunch of areas. Serbia, you know, remember Serbia it all starts with that assassination. They wanted to join up with, with some of those other ethnic Serbs. You see a lot of the former Austria-Hungary empire combined into what would be Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is not around anymore. It breaks up a little bit after World War II. Uh, but again, the map literally changes. That's nationalism. That's one of the things that Wilson was pushing for, these different groups, you know, having countries of their own, because nationalism was one of the things that led to the war to begin with. So here are the terms you got to know. Because Wilson was unable to convince the other allies to accept all aspects of his 14 points, Germany was punished severely. Treaty of Versailles basically said this, and these are the ones you got to know because they're the ones that probably most directly impact World War II. Germany had to accept full responsibility for the war. That's pretty wild when you consider this starts with Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. Um, but Germany did have the most powerful military. They were the ones that were engaged in the most warfare. Um, so they have to basically sign on the dotted line. It was all our fault, which again, I don't know if that's exactly true. Germany was forced to pay what was then, you know, they said gold marks in there, approximately $33 billion in war reparations. Today, that would be close to $402 billion. What do you think that did to the German economy? Yeah, went downhill. All right, this is, this is setting up Germany uh, to be in a very desperate situation. Germany loses all of their overseas colonies. Remember, they had land in Africa. They had some land elsewhere. Well, that, that gets split up between the two main leaders of the Allies, Great Britain and France. Uh, Germany lost a lot of land area in Europe itself. Uh, they talked about Poland, uh, you know, that, that area, the Rhineland, that, that kind of is on the border of France and Germany becomes a demilitarized zone, kind of a buffer. Uh, that way, you know, it, it would be harder for Germany to attack France again. And Germany was not allowed to build their military back up. They had been the German war machine. They were trying to create the largest army in history, you know, and, and they were pretty successful early on. Uh, the other countries of Europe wanted to make sure they couldn't do that again. So they limited their troop sizes. They didn't allow them to have an air force. The size of their navy was very small. 
They wanted to keep them in a weakened state. As a result, the German economy suffered from sky high inflation and eventual unemployment. Things start to kind of turn around a little bit. Uh, then in 1929, we get the onset of the Great Depression, which was global in nature. You know, it started here in the U.S., but it spread everywhere. Uh, so now you've got a Germany that is very desperate. You've got the German people who were incredibly proud. Again, nationalism still alive and well there. Um, they, they thought at the beginning of the war that they were going to win this thing easily because they did have the largest, most powerful military. And then they just lose. And, and you know, then this new government that kind of took over, this transitional government, goes into the Paris Peace Conference and agrees to all this crap. German people are resentful. They don't trust their government. They're hungry. They're without jobs. They, they're going through some really rough times. And anytime you get a country where there's a lot of crazy stuff going on, they're always a little bit more willing to accept extreme ideas. That's how Hitler came to power. I mean, Hitler, and it's a weird story. We'll go over it when we get into World War II. But Adolf Hitler was democratically elected. OK, then he started doing crazy things to where he seized ultimate power to where he was the totalitarian dictator. But but he was elected to his original position. Guys, people knew he was a racist. He wrote a whole book about hating the Jewish people and hating a lot of people. He bought into all those ideas of social Darwinism. But remember, he's not the only one that would have believed that at the time because those ideas were, were somewhat widespread. They knew Hitler was a little off. But they they elected him anyway because he promised to fix things. And believe it or not, he did. OK, he came in and he tore up the Treaty of Versailles and he started immediately building up their military and started investing in public works projects. Have you guys ever heard of the Autobahn? It's uh, this big highway in Germany. You can go like 120. There's no speed limit or anything. OK, big public works project. Well, that's something that he could hire people to go back to work. More people have jobs or spending more money. The economy starts ramping back up. He starts report. He starts, you know, repairing Germany's national pride. You know, all of a sudden they've got this strong leader again. And even though the other countries of Europe were looking at this saying, oh, man, he's he's going against everything they're supposed to do. They let him do it because they thought, you know what? We don't want another conflict. Yeah, OK, maybe the treaty was a little fair. He's a strong leader. Let him do his thing. We don't want to fight, OK, because, you know, you got to understand World War II is 20 years later and Hitler takes over well before that. So nobody was ready for another fight. Nobody wanted another fight and they let Hitler get away with this. They let him build up his military. Then he started taking over territories, but they were former territories that they had lost in World War One. And people looked back at the treaty and said, OK, yeah, it was kind of messed up, you know, and they let him do it and do it until he went too far. So without the terms of the treaty, how they were, if maybe they had been a little bit more equal, you know, not casting all the blame on Germany, maybe Germany doesn't just go down the tubes and maybe the people aren't desperate enough to to elect a racist madman, which was, you know, people knew that about. It, but they were willing to do anything to restore what they felt was the loss of their national pride. I mean, that's how nationalism continues to drive wars, even in World War Two. Crazy stuff. We'll get more into exactly how Hitler comes to power and all the weird, crazy things he believed um, a little bit later here in a couple of weeks. This set the stage for an extreme militaristic political party known as the Nazis to take power barely 15 years later. Crazy stuff. So that's Europe. What about everywhere else? You know, uh, uh, Wilson had talked about, you know, these these conquered people, these colonized people. Man, they want countries of their own. They should be free. And he was only talking about white people. He was only talking about Europeans because Wilson like a lot of other world leaders at the time, had some beliefs in social Darwinism and white man's burden himself. Although colonial peoples had participated in World War I and many had been promised independence, like legit promised independence, the big four had no interest in freeing the colonies. 
Wilson in particular believed the right to self-determination only applied directly to white Europeans. Arab rebels of the former Ottoman Empire were especially insulted as they were specifically promised self-rule if they fought with the Allies. We didn't talk a whole lot about the Ottomans. It's like, what were they doing in the war? Well, they had to deal with internal uprising. I mean, yeah, there, there were the British down there and a lot of their, their colonies like New Zealand and Australia fought a lot against the Ottomans. But they had help from the people that actually lived in the Ottoman Empire. A lot of the Arabs of the Middle East, you know, they were promised countries of their own. They were promised, directly promised by the British and the French, hey, if you fight with us and you help to overthrow the Ottomans, we're going to carve this territory up and we're going to give each of you groups, because there's different types of Arabs, we're going to give each of you groups countries of their own. I mean, we're going to give you self-determination. And they bought into that and they rose up against the Ottomans and, and with the Europeans, you know, the Ottomans were ultimately defeated. That ain't what happened, though. Okay, the Arabs do not get independence by and large. Uh, a secret treaty is signed between Great Britain and France called the sykes picot Agreement. This is 1916. This is before the war is even over. They already know what they're going to do. Essentially, Great Britain and France secretly conspire to divide much of the former Ottoman lands into their own spheres of influence. Uh, you look here on the map uh, on the left, you know, the, the French got these mandates, they called them, uh, in places like Syria, Turkey, what was left of the Ottoman Empire, got to keep, you know, largely the Anatolian Peninsula. The British got what was now Iraq. They also got what today is Israel and some of the surrounding countries like Jordan. Um, you know, back then it was called Palestine. Through the new League of Nations, the Allies established a mandate system to rule the colonies and territories of the Central Powers. So the British, the French, the Allies, they went back on their war. They, they betrayed the people that had helped them in the Middle East. You fast forward in history, in the Middle East, there's still a lot of distrust of the West. Okay, Western Europe, the United States, I mean, there's, there's a rich history there. And I mean, not all of it's justified, but some of it certainly is. Uh, and some of that mistrust goes all the way back to World War I. This infuriated many Arabs and set the stage for a nationalistic movement known as Pan-Arabism, an ideology that called for the unification of all lands in North Africa and Southwest Asia. Uh, Pan-Africanism also developed in Africa. I mean, a bunch of Africans fought in World War I as well. Another source of conflict in the Middle East came when the British, who became in charge of Palestine, issued the Balfour Declaration, which supported the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. You know, Palestine, a.k.a. Israel, you know, it's, it's the center of faith for a lot of different people. So, go ahead. Uh, you know, Christianity, I mean, it originates there. Judaism originates there. Uh, for Islam, it's a sacred land as well. Well, back long ago, back in Roman times, you know, the majority of, of Jews, you know, fled that territory, their, their ancestral homeland because of repeated invasions. We called it the diaspora. We talked about it at the very beginning of the year. And, and a lot of Jews, you know, really migrated all around, but, but especially in Europe, where they were constantly seen as outsiders. They were seen as perpetual immigrants. There was a lot of discrimination against Jews for many, many years. Well, now that this land, you know, that, that since then had been largely taken over by Muslims, Palestinians, now that this land was officially under the control of the British, the British started letting more and more Jews move back to what they considered to be their promised land. So there's animosity between the Muslims that live there, the Palestinians, and the Jews that are moving in, ultimately the Israelis. Then World War II happened and Jews are just targeted for annihilation. Uh, we'll get into the Holocaust. But once the war was over, there was more of an outcry of, hey, you know, the Jewish people need a country of their own. So the United Nations decided to give it to them. And there's been fighting over this land ever since. It's still going on to this day to some extent between, you know, Jewish Israelis and, and Muslim Palestinians, you know, who have this shared claim to land uh, but because of European intervention, you know, 
man, there's just been a lot of animosity there ever since. We'll get more into the the Arab-Israeli conflict a little bit later, uh, but no, a lot of the problems that we still have in the Middle East, they kind of start with how uh, how World War One ended. The Allied powers believe the colonized people in Africa, Asia, required tutelage from the more advanced territories in order to survive. Again, it goes back to that idea of white man's burden. Guys, a lot of places, you know, the Vietnam, for instance, we talked about Ho Chi Minh uh, not too long ago. I mean, all these different places, when they heard about the 14 points, they thought they were going to get their independence. In some places, especially in the Middle East, were promised their independence if they fought for the Allies. And then once the war was over, those promises were broken. A lot of mistrust. Okay, so nationalism is going to be renewed. Uh, there's going to be a lot of mistrust of the West. And it's really not until after World War II that you see a lot of these places finally get their independence, even though they were promised them much, much earlier. Now, we were going to watch a little video over the Sykes-Picot agreement, but, you know, I think, I think you guys get the gist. We only got about 14 minutes left. That is not that much time, uh, but it's enough time to maybe just double check your grades. Grades should be up to date. Um, if you did the extra credit quiz yesterday, I haven't put that in yet. There's some of those in there. If you very recently did a retake, that may or may not be in there, but check your grades. If there's anything you're missing, man, you know, you got till 430. That's pretty much it. I uh, didn't end quite as early as I wanted, but uh, you know, this is enough time to at least double check your stuff, see if there's anything that's wrong. Uh, and maybe if there's something you're missing, maybe during lunch, you could still get it done. But again, 430 is going to be the cutoff. Other than that, y'all hang loose.